at that war. Look at the next phrase. Testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Whoa! What did you just read? See, I, I love to point out to my juniors how you think you can read until it's pointed out to you, man, i got to learn how to do this better. Do you see what you just read? The 16th President of the United States, 87 years after Tom Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, that guy says, I don't know if we're going to make it. Dude, go back and read it. We are now engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. I don't know if we're going to make it. Any of us that ever been on a ball club where there was this happening? Any of us that ever been in families where this kind of thing was happening? Any of us that stood there and watched one of those parents drive away? We, we know what it feels like to watch the end of something. Lincoln didn't know if it was going to work out. This is significant because we have a tendency to read history from the perspective of how we know it finished. A few years later, the war is over, the Union has won, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, all the slaves get to be freed, a hundred years later, finally they get the right to vote, and now we can go to ball games where black and white play together. Of course, it worked out. Dude, it's fine. We're all fine. We read history from the perspective of looking backwards from where we are. Lincoln, in 1863, went, Man, I don't know if we'll make it to year 100. I don't know. I wonder, he says. He muses out loud with the rest of the people listening, and then later millions of people who read this, and he goes, The leader of the nation says, Man, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to make it is look at touch and go right now. Which, if you'll think about it, makes sense. Did you not hear what we said? Ten Warlands in three days of a four-year war. Yeah, he's being honest, huh? Man, I don't know if we're going to make this thing. Make it personal. Lincoln was not sure that you would be sitting here. Ten Warlands in three days. It begs the question, we can... Can we go on like this? Notice the next line. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. Notice sentence length. Very brief. Very brief. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come off. Why are we here? What is the point of being here? We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. Brilliant. 87 years ago, a nation was born. I'm not sure if we're going to make it. The reason we're here is to say thank you to the men who died so that the nation could live. Does that make any sense to you? Does that make absolutely any sense to you? If you lost the person you loved, ten of them in three days, ten worlds in three days, and the answer to why they had to die was so you could live. What? Does that make absolutely any sense to you? Totally counterintuitive. Think about it. It makes absolutely no sense. People have to die so that you can live? Obvious question. What, what are you talking about? Wait a minute. He didn't say so that you could live. He said so that the nation could live. What nation? The nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition all men are created equal. That nation, the nation called America, not the Union, not the Confederacy, America. Notice he doesn't use the name America. He just calls it the nation. Skip a few lines down to the very end of the 272 words. It's called the people. Lincoln was acutely aware that to talk about America means you have to talk about Americans. 
Whitman's people, right? One of his favorite poets, Walt Whitman, I hear America singing. People. Americans make America. And some Americans have to die so that other Americans can live. Look how he finishes this paragraph. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. In other words, we're not wasting our time standing on this hollowed ground, as he will call it. We're not wasting our time. So, notice how I exegete. I'm trying to model for you as we go. We read it after a little bit of background information. Then we start to exegete or to work it out line by line, word by word, and then we pack it all back together. So here we go at level one again. If the first paragraph says, in the past, 87 years ago, there was this experiment that got tried. The second paragraph says, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this experiment's going to do it. I don't know if the nation's going to endure or not, but I do know this. We're here because a lot of people had to die 10 worlds in three days so that the nation could make it is the right thing to do to be here. Notice the genius of the construction. Long, short, long. See the sentence constructions. It's varying his sentences. We're here and it's right. It's altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Now to the third paragraph. <laughs> and this is darkly ironic. After saying what he has said, we need to be here. This is the right thing to do. Look what he says. Darkly ironic. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. Whoa, what did you just read? He says, we need to be here. We need to do this. Ten Warlands in three days, you better have an answer. But we can't give one. Did you see what he just said? But in a larger sense, by the way, notice your threes here. Brilliant, right? We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. He makes a good point. Dude, what words are you going to speak to make it any more powerfully obvious something really bad happened? Ten worlds in three days. I mean, what more are you going to say, right? <laughs> Look at what he says next. The brave men living and dead who struggled. Notice he doesn't use the word fight. Did you see it? Who struggled here. This is that diction thing. He chooses his words very carefully. It isn't a fight. It's a struggle. Who struggled here have consecrated it, the ground, far above our poor power to add or detract. They've already done the work. The people who died, 51,000 people, the living and the dead. And for those of us that have studied, for example, a, a Stephen Crane passage on occurrence of war, know that sometimes being wounded was, was being like dead, right? Especially in the field hospitals of the American Civil War. And now to the darkest irony of all ironies. Are you ready for this? And man, you're going to feel insulted, and you probably should feel insulted, but it's not your fault. Nobody maybe had told you this. Look what he says next. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Oh, you're never going to read a more ironic, darkly ironic line. Lincoln says, nobody could ever forget ten worlds in three days. And I have juniors that go... Dude, until you told me that, I never, never knew that. But if I were to say to you, the Gettysburg Address, most of you would go, oh yeah, I remember that was on a worksheet in eighth grade, something about some, some president or something, guy that looked funny in a funny hat and had a beard or something. If we remember anything about Gettysburg, it is what? Lincoln's speech. Ironically, Lincoln says, nobody's going to remember what I'm saying here, but they will never forget Ten worlds in three days. Which does beg a really intriguing question. How can you not know that? And all the other Americans whose lives have been sacrificed so that you can sit there now and try not to doze off in a lecture on them. When do you accept that fact? It was their country before it's yours. <laughs> 
I would write that line down. It was their country before it was yours. Theirs. And they said, yeah. I will stop breathing so that others can. And you have a hard time staying awake? At what point do you recognize that is your legacy? You. So that the next time the national anthem is played, don't you have a responsibility to say thank you? Because it was their country before it was yours. <laughs> Which begs an obvious question, whose country will it be next? Hmm. Notice he continues, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Now notice this transition. This is genius. We want to point it out in our notes. Lincoln now will say, enough with the past. Let's start thinking about the future. Those left alive. What do we do now? This was an obvious question after 10 warlords in three days. What do we do now? Lincoln's answer, boy, oh boy, you cannot stop. Whatever you do, don't stop. Because if you stop, then you make all of these dead of no value. Look how he says it. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great... Look what he calls it now. It's not a struggle. Are you reading closely with me? I hope you are. It's not a struggle. It's a task. To the great task remaining before us. Notice the use of the, da of the dashes. Dash. That from these honored dead... Notice he calls them honored dead. Notice he doesn't call them confederacy or union honored dead. He just calls them honored dead. We take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Notice all the parentheticals with that. By the way, if you want to go back and study the Declaration of Independence, second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments instituted among men. Lincoln is following the exact same pattern of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson's genius. Lincoln's just going to follow it. Notice that we here highly resolve, make up our minds, that these dead shall not have died in vain. All of the dead, both the North and the South. That this, he comes back to it, nation under God. It's the only mention of deity in the entire speech. The only time he mentions God. Notice, not much mention at all of religion or deity, but here it is, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. Notice he doesn't use the word liberty. Here it's freedom instead. He began with birth, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived. He began with birth, and now he ends with birth. A new birth. Notice, of freedom. And that, now he's not going to call it a nation. He's going to call it a government. The same language that Jefferson will use in his Declaration of Independence. That government, notice your, tr your trinities, your threes. Of the people. By the people. For the people. Jeffersonian democracy. All you got to do is go back and look at the... Declaration of Independence, and there it is. That's Jeffersonian democracy through and through. It's perfect right there. Of the people shall not perish from the earth. Did you see the last phrase? It may be all over. We may not make it. But he says, I hope we do. Because if we make it, that's the tribute to all these dead. Ten more women. I mean, if you can't sit up and at least pay attention to that, then I think maybe you need to check your moral compass. Because that is what Lincoln will challenge us to do. A nation, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. You hear people say, I hate the government? Lincoln would not understand that. 
He would say, dude, you are the government. You are the nation. It is you. America is Americans. That's you. All right, let's finish our exegesis now quickly, shall we? At level one, I think we've done our job. At level 2A, go ahead and jot down at least one message that you can derive from a classic essay like this, a classic persuasive speech like this. Obviously, one of the central ones is we have to understand what it means when this many people die. And what is it that they died for? A new birth, a birth of freedom, of liberty, which, of course, is going to brilliantly finish the circle from 87 years ago in Jefferson to now. Right? Another possible message, America is Americans. That's the central key, right? Let's jump to 2B really quickly. I've already mentioned so many different things here again. Notice the power of trinities, of threes. Notice the modulation of sentence length. That's also highly important. Notice length of essay. This speech is so short, right? I've spent way more time talking about this speech than the speech itself. Of course, to be fair, when this thing is published, people start dissecting it and they go, oh, this guy is genius. He said so much in so few words. So much of it that he doesn't say. I like to ask that question about any work we study. Notice what doesn't get said in this essay. Notice the word slavery doesn't appear one time in this whole essay, in this whole speech. Not one time. Why are we fighting this thing? The emancipation of slaves. Nope. We're fighting this thing for freedom, for liberty. Whose freedom? Right. That's right. That is right. Because all Americans have to be free. Slave owner and slave. Brilliant. Let's look, let's look now at 3A. Other texts that come to mind, I've already mentioned, obviously, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech. It works so nicely. To study the Declaration of Independence, then the Gettysburg Address, and then MLK Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, oh, by the way, the last time I counted, that's three, are the three speeches of American history that you have to know well to understand what it means to be an American. If you're not patriotic, it isn't your fault. It is that no one's shown you a reason to be patriotic. If you can look at those three documents and not have some sense of loyalty to your country, then you need to check your moral compass. That would be the encouragement of Jefferson, Lincoln, and MLK, as well as this old man. Let's talk really quickly at 3B. What is it for you to mean to be an American? What do you think of memorials? What do you think of the idea of dying for your country? What do you think when you say the Pledge of Allegiance and that pledge to a flag? So many people have died for three days, 10 warmers. Blows our mind even now to think about it. All the millions and millions of people who have died so that you can sit in a room and ask, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a patriot? What does it mean to be a citizen of a great country? These are questions, I think, at 3B that we have to engage. I think it's worth our time to try to give some thought to it. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm glad that we were able to introduce the text to you.